Good morning, dear friends. Welcome to Daybreak. Psalmist in Psalm 66 1 says, Praise God, shouts of joy, sing to the glory of His name. Yes, dear friends, every morning reminds us of God's fresh love. Our life is His great gift for us. So we ought to praise His holy name. Therefore, let's join the choir in singing and praising our Creator. Spirit leads me on in 
the power of your love. Hasn't been a spiritually uplifting song with the same spirit. Let's now listen to today's message. A lady one day walked into a shop which had a board outside which said everything that your heart desires is available in this shop. The lady who was so curious went inside and spoke to the shopkeeper. It is written outside that you sell everything that the heart desires. So here is what I want you to give me. Can you please give me some peace of mind? a little bit of love in my heart and some joy in my family. And to that, the shopkeeper smiled and said to the lady, I am happy to know the desires of your heart. But just note this one thing, madam. In this shop, we only sell the seeds and not the fruits. This is the logic of our Christian life as well. God has given all of us the seeds of good things. But the fruits would be given only if we sow these seeds in the proper places. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 25 verse 14 to 30. Jesus narrates the parable of the talents. Jesus speaks of how different people are given different measures of talents. The ones who had more went and invested those talents and they would come back with the fruits. But this one particular man who had only one talent would bury that talent, not make use of it and would come back empty handed to the master. As Christians, as people of God, all of us are given various talents. The seeds of goodness have been given to all of us. What is needed and expected of all of us is that we should go out and sow these seeds in order to receive the fruits of life. We need to invest these seeds in the proper places, in the proper situations, so that we can reap together the harvest of God's love and grace in our life. Very often, we as Christians tend to waste our life in laziness. We are sometimes afraid of what God will feel if I do this or that. We are afraid to have an optimistic view of life. And because of that, we hide away our talents. We don't sow the seeds that have been given to us. And we must know the end that happened to this man of the parable of the talents. The master would reprimand him, punish him and take away what he had and give to the one who had more. When we don't do and fulfill the duties and responsibilities given to us, we would have a hard end to our life. Each of us are gifted with the seeds of goodness in our life. Let's go forth to harvest and sow these seeds so that we can receive the fruits of God's love in our lives. And thus, everything that our hearts desires can be fulfilled by what God wants in our life. May the name of the Lord be ever praised. And may God always give us this gift to go forth and sow the seeds and receive the fruits of God's love in our life. Live Jesus. On the first Sunday after Christmas, the Church celebrates the Feast of the Holy Family. This Feast of the Holy Family commemorates the lives of Jesus, Mary and Joseph together, and so this celebration focuses on religious family life. It was Pope Leo XIII who originally promoted this feast due to the general breakdown of the family at the end of the past century, hoping to instill in Christian families a model for faithful love self-sacrifice and honor for God. 
The devotion to the Holy Family was born in Bethlehem together with the baby Jesus. The shepherds went to adore the child and, at the same time, they gave honor to his family. Later, in a similar way, the three wise men came from the east to adore and give honor to the newborn king with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh that would be safeguarded by his family. In a certain sense, Christ himself was the first devotee of his family. He showed his devotion to his mother and foster father by submitting himself with infinite humility to the duty of filial obedience towards them. This submission and humility are key aspects of the relationships within the Holy Family that are astounding. For God, who is served by the angels, submits to Mary at the Annunciation and to Joseph as her husband. Mary, who is without sin, submits to Joseph. Jesus, who is God incarnate, submits to both his parents. Saint Bernard of Clairvaux remarks that this humility is without precedent. A human creature commands God. It is sublime beyond measure. We can look at our family life and ask if we also are able to practice such submission and humility as did the members of the Holy Family. While Jesus clearly obeyed the fourth commandment to honor one's parents, we also see his parents exercised great loving care for him. As Joseph was chosen by God to protect the Holy Family, he is also named the patron of the Catholic Church. Pope Francis I was inaugurated to the papacy on the feast of St. Joseph, and he focused his acceptance speech upon the importance of Joseph's role as protector of his family in our world today. He proclaimed, How does Joseph exercise his role as protector? Discreetly, humbly, and silently, but with an unfailing presence and utter fidelity, even when he finds it hard to understand. From the time of his marriage to Mary until the finding of the twelve-year-old Jesus in the temple of Jerusalem, he is there at every moment with loving care. As the spouse of Mary, he is at her side in good times and bad, on the journey to Bethlehem for the census, and in the anxious and joyful hours when she gave birth, amid the drama of the flight into Egypt, and during the frantic search for their child in the temple, and later in the day-to-day -day life of the home of Nazareth, in the workshop where he taught his trade to Jesus. Joseph was constantly attentive to God, open to the signs of God's presence, and receptive to God's plans and not simply his own. Joseph is a protector because he is able to hear God's voice and be guided by his will, and for this reason he is all the more sensitive to the persons entrusted to his safekeeping. A protector means respecting each of God's creatures and respecting the environment in which we live. It means protecting people, showing loving concern for each and every person, especially children, the elderly, those in need, who are often the last we think about. It means caring for one another in our families. Husbands and wives first protect one another, and then as parents they care for their children, and children themselves in time protect their parents. It means building sincere friendships in which we protect one another in trust, respect, and goodness. In the end, everything has been entrusted to our protection, and all of us are responsible for it. Be protectors of God's gifts. To be protectors, we also have to keep watch over ourselves. Let us not forget that hatred, envy, and pride defile our lives. Being protectors, then, also means keeping watch over our emotions, over our hearts, because they are the seat of good and evil intentions, intentions that build up or tear down. In the Gospels, St. Joseph appears as a strong and courageous man, a working man, yet in his heart we see great tenderness, which is not the virtue of the weak, but rather a sign of strength of spirit and a capacity for concern, for compassion, for genuine openness to others, for love. We must not be afraid of goodness, of tenderness. As we celebrate the feast of the Holy Family this year, let us examine also how we are called to be protectors, as the Pope has asked us, 
of one another and for all of creation. Let us pray today for our families. Most loving Jesus, by your sublime and beautiful virtues of humility, obedience, poverty, modesty, charity, patience, and gentleness, you blessed with peace and happiness the family which you chose on earth. In your mercy, look upon my family. We belong to you, for we have received your many blessings over many years, and we entrust ourselves to your loving care. Preserve us from danger, give us help in time of need, and grant us the grace to persevere in faith to the end. Glorious Patriarch St. Joseph, help us by your powerful prayers, and offer our prayers to Jesus through Mary's hands. Amen. Now prepare our hearts to receive today's spiritual food through daily bread. Praise the Lord. Dear friends, welcome to the daily bread, a daily reflection on the word of God. We are in the season of nativity or Christmas. And we are reading and reflecting on passages that are related to the nativity and infancy of Jesus. Today, I read from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews, for we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then he secretly called the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, Bring the word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there, ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to hear it, they left for their own country by another road. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Dear friends, we are in the season of nativity, reading the infancy narratives. We have been reading the, from the Gospel of Luke and gives a totally different picture of the nativity and infancy of Jesus. It is Luke who says that the parents of Jesus were at Nazareth and they had made a long journey to, uh, to Bethlehem because of the decree of Caesar Augustus. And the child was born and uh, uh, kept in a manger and they went to the temple, etc. When you come to the Gospel of Matthew, we see a totally different picture. Nothing of the journey, nothing of the shepherds or manger. It would seem that Jesus was born in a house. How to reconcile uh, to these, these uh, records, we do not know. Only one thing is clear. Both evangelists are presenting Jesus as born in Bethlehem. 
And Matthew has his own interest in describing the story, and Luke has his own different interest. Matthew's special, specific interest is to point out that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David, son of Abraham, who was promised by God and who was expected by the Jews. But when he came, the Jews did not recognize him. Not only did not recognize, but rejected him and tried to kill him. That is what being presented here. Whereas for Luke, Jesus is the savior of the world, especially the savior of the poor. So there is a difference in perspective, difference in motivations. And another motive that Luke, Matthew is presenting, Jesus as the new Moses, the new redeemer, the new lawgiver, the covenant maker. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant of Sinai, and Jesus is the new, new Moses who brings the new covenant. And the infancy of Moses and Jesus are also compared similarly. Now, what is more important is what is Matthew is telling. When Jesus was born, there was a star leading people, wise men from the east. We are not told they are kings. We are not told they were free. It is the tradition. The later fathers who found out or who concocted the story that these were three kings and their names also were presented as Melchior, Balthasar and Caspar. So these are all later traditions. What we are told, these are three wise men, people of other nations, other races, Gentiles who were waiting for the Messiah, the Lord, and they came. They came following the star, the people who observed the nature. They were guided by the Spirit, and they were led to Bethlehem. First, they went to Jerusalem and to the palace, thinking a king should be born in a palace. That's what everybody would expect. But later on, they found he was not in the palace. See, the Gentiles come seeking, going, well, such a, taking such a long journey not knowing where it leads, but they were ready to go to any extent. On the other hand, the people of the land, the king and the people, the priests and the lawyers, scribes, all the elders, they were terrified when they knew, when they got the news that the Messiah is born. And they know exactly where it is going to happen, but they do not want to go and see. Later on, he tells them, go and t uh, report to me when the child, where you find the child, not to adore him, but to do away with him. So these are two attitudes, the Gentiles and the Jews. This can be also valid for us. The child is born. Are we ready to accept him? Are we ready to surrender ourselves to this? Or are we like Herod and the people afraid? Perhaps not afraid, but we have to see also how we, what we wait for, what we look for in the Savior. Here, they came and they saw they saw Jesus with Mary, as did the shepherds find Jesus with Mary and Joseph. Here the shepherds see Jesus with Mary and worship him, not Mary, but Jesus. But they see Jesus with Mary, so through Mary to Jesus. So the Mary is presented as a very important character, but not as one worshipped, but as the one with whom you see Jesus. So now let us also come to Jesus through Mary and worship him, accept him as the Lord, as a Redeemer, and our King. Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming to this world, you the Emmanuel, you the Jesus, the Savior, who has come to give us life eternal. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for making us children of God through Jesus Christ. Be this prayer we make through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Surely, today's Bible reflection has given you new insights to renew your life. As we come to the end of this episode of Daybreak, let's once again praise our God with this song.
praise that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name as morning dawns and evening fades you inspire songs of praise that rise from to touch your heart and glorify your name, your name is a strong and mighty tower, your name is a shelter like no other, your name, let the nation sing it loud. Cause nothing has the power to say Your name The strong and mighty tower Your name Is a shelter like no other Your name Let the nation sing it louder Cause nothing has the power to say but your name
I'm sure the last half an hour has really been a blessing to you all. Till we meet again, stay blessed.